Hi, I'm Edwin Rutsch, Director of the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy, and today we're going to have a, a for and against empathy uh, dialogue here with Jesse, Jesse Prince and uh, Lori Gruen. Uh, thank you both for joining me for this uh, dialogue. Thank you, Edwin. Thank you, Edwin. And uh, the, uh, well, the, the process we're going to use is actually an empathic listening or active listening process. So either of you, or you can speak to me as well, can you know, state your point for or against empathy or anything you want around empathy. And the other person, uh, before they will uh, speak and uh, share their uh, perspective, they will rephrase or summarize uh, what the other person has said just until that person feels like they've been fully understood. So we're going to try to use a little bit of an empathic listening approach for this, and we'll see how this goes. So uh, before we do that, perhaps each of you could just uh, introduce yourselves. Lori? Okay. Um, well, I'm Lori Gruen, and I... Um teach philosophy and gender studies um, at Wesleyan University where I also chair the philosophy department and chair the faculty committee on the Center for Prison Education. Um, and I recently um, published a little book called Entangled Empathy. Thanks, Edmund. <laughs> and I'm Jesse Prince, also a philosopher. I teach at the City University of New York Graduate Center and uh, I also direct the Committee for Interdisciplinary Science Studies here. Okay, and I just mentioned you've written uh, several articles and actually been on some panels uh, speaking uh, against empathy. Uh, so just kind of setting that framework. So who would like to begin? You can either speak to me or you can speak to the other person and that person will just reflect back with their hearing until you feel fully heard. And then just say, okay, I'm done. And then it's the other person's uh, turn to speak. Jesse, maybe you should start. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, uh, Lori. I, I should say, just for the record, because it's such a form of self-assassination to come on record as being against empathy, that that, that characterization is somewhat of a, of a distortion. I do uh, see empathy as a tremendously valuable tool in human life. I think it's a lubricant for human relationships. I don't think we can have successful dyadic interpersonal relationships with, with other people or as Laurie has so convincingly argued with other uh, creatures without an empathetic uh, attitude. And I do think that in contexts like this too, professional context, academic discussion, context of learning, empathy can also be a tremendous boon. So my, my critiques of empathy have really been more narrow than that. And they've taken the form of looking at empathy as a potential tool for moral decision making. And the thought there is, is uh, really quite simple to summarize. It comes down to the view that empathy introduces bias. That empathy is very, very good at forming a close uh, relationship of mutual understanding and concern with another individual, but it's less well suited to dealing with people who are distant from you, dealing with people who are different from you, and dealing from dealing with people who might not be individuals but whole groups or whole populations who are adversely affected by by some uh, matter of policy. So when we're we're trying to decide what should we do, what's ethically required of me, if we focus on the individuals with whom we have an empathetic bond there's a risk that we'll end up giving preferential treatment to them and give inadequate uh, concern or in, show inadequate care for those uh, who might be in most trouble. The people distant from us, the people least like us, uh, least like us where the us are people in very privileged parts of the world uh, are often the ones who, who need our help most desperately. Okay, let me try to rephrase that in, in oh, the yeah. form of this. So, um, I, w when it's very pretty specific, Jesse's um, written this very explicitly as well that um, in personal relationships and professional relationships, it's empathy is really important, and it really is a concern of yours that empathy um, can 
not help us particularly well when we're trying to think about the complex moral problems um, that we face because um, it's too narrow and biased and the biases that I think that you're most worried about and that at least I'm worried about as well um, tend to be biases um, that have to do with both sort of proximity and in-group biases um, and, and that would be a worry, I think, if it were the case um, that these kinds of features of empathy were somehow fixed. Um, we wouldn't want to have a moral system or an ethical practice that sort of built into it these kinds of in-group biases or proximity biases. But my sense of empathy uh, is... Just a second, uh, Laurie, before we go on. I just want to be sure, uh, Jesse, did she get oh. what you had to say? I mean, do yeah. you feel like you were heard? Completely, yes. Okay, okay, sorry. Go okay, ahead. no problem. So my sense um, is that these things, uh, these biases, which we do notice, um, are quite flexible. And so, um, and there's been a number of actually sort of interesting brain studies, too, that um, if you change the self-concept of the individual, make the individual, ironically, more independent rather than interdependent in contexts in which um, there's a pronounced in-group bias, that that bias can be overcome. And it strikes me that that, I mean, given that ethics always requires sort of this process of um, sort of reevaluation, it seems like that empathy, um, that sort of a robust kind of empathy also would require that is um, doesn't seem odd or pr troubling to me. Um, I actually think that um, sort of taking empathy um, and engaging in a, what I call entangled empathy which combines empathetic concern with uh, sort of a, a robust affective um, and cognitive component um, is actually really helpful for ethics and so in this way I think we probably really do at least disagree um, and I'm interested to hear why that I know at one point Jesse you've said that you think that trying to resuscitate empathy in the way that I do for ethics is um, probably superfluous we don't really need to do that and so I, I wonder if, if you might be interested in saying if you still think that and if that's something that you want to say more about. So the bias, if you can overcome the biases, should we get rid of empathy then too? Great. So let me all try and get that. There's a lot there, but, but um, I mean, I think both in, in listening to you and in reading the book, one of the things that you've been very um, compelling in developing is this idea that, that we shouldn't take our kind of default empathetic disposition as our as our end place that's the starting place but empathy is a skill and like any other skill it can be it can be improved and if there are biases of proximity uh, for instance or in-group biases where we preferentially treat people close to us or like us we can overcome those and working to make empathy extend to a broader range of others is a worthwhile project that could could have important value for for moral practice um, and then you ended with a question, <laughs> which is, why, why should we throw that away? So you've read me as saying that even if empathy could be improved, it would be in some, in some sense superfluous. And I, um, I don't want to overstate that case, I and mean, partly because I think your particular handling of this issue has been very good in that you do see empathy as, as a tool that needs needs refinement and I, I think your suggestions for refinement are exactly of the right kind. Uh, the, the, the structure of that argument was supposed to go if we've already figured out who, whose concerns we need to understand more, if we've already figured out uh, who deserves more regard, then our work is kind of done. There's no further need to engage in empathetic practice. So if you think about this in the context of distributive justice and you say, well, there are some individuals who are not getting what they deserve. They're not getting equal treatment. They're not getting fair treatment. Um, once you've identified those individuals, um, if, if because they're distant from you, 
you haven't yet engaged in a kind of empathetic understanding of their situation, the, the thought of this argument that you're asking me to, to articulate is you've already done the work that's needed. They're the ones who deserve our moral attention, and now what we should do is engage in actions to somehow correct for the inequal, uh, inequality, correct for the, the poor, poor treatment. Um, you know, it, it might put it in the context of certain specific issues. If you look, for example, at global poverty, and you realize that some people have been uh, prevented from accessing opportunities for, for fulfilling basic life function, basic life faculty, basic uh, well-being. Um, once you've identified those individuals or that those parts of the world where that need exists, that's an immediate call to action. And then there's this thought, well, once you've done that action, you don't need the empathy. And I think very rightly, one thing that I've really learned from, from reflecting on this with your work in hand is maybe there is a further job for empathy. So I guess what I'd like to do is take, take your question and by way of dialogue say, okay, let's think together about what further work empathy would do once you've gotten to that point. Great. So uh, to repeat or to restate or to, there's a lot there too, but the idea I think was um, um, that insofar as we have to worry about where to direct our moral attention, as it were, um, I think um, in some sense that uh, empathy is sort of in part directive. Um, and you're suggesting, I think, uh, that if we can I get have access to the um, subjects or objects of our moral concern um, without empathy um, because say we get there because we recognize there's a grave injustice or that there's not uh, that there's global poverty um, which is a grave injustice um, that we don't we don't actually need the empathy to sort of direct our attention to it um, and I guess so is that sound about what yeah. you were saying, Jess? So, um, it, and it seems to me that that's, um, that's an important, I think, point. I, um, I think that there's an, an interesting sense in which um, sort of what some neuroscientists call justice sensitivity and, and empathetic concern are, are actually kind of compatible rather than incompatible. Um, and it strikes me, um, I wonder if this makes sense, but it, it strikes me that these things could be sort of, that empathetic engagement could actually enrich our understandings of how to serve justice. So I think that that's probably what I have in mind. Um, and I think part of what is, came, this came to me um, in my work, um, I taught a seminar in prison, I taught a theory of justice to my, got my advanced students in prison, um, and one of the things that was really interesting was reading John Rawls in the context of, you know, conditions in which um, folks really, by all uh, accounts, are the least well off in society, and they really did not like being identified that way, but that's how it was pretty clear. Um, in the sort of not in the ideal sense, in the ideal sense, they would have been. Um, in the non-ideal sense of applying the ideal of um, the least well off, they were that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that one of the things that can goes wrong with more idealized versions, we don't need to get into some, the details of these arguments, but one of the things that goes wrong um, is that once we recognize these injustices, we can often um, sort of flatten out what justice demands as a response to that sort of inequality, as it were. And so it seems to me that empathy and sort of empathy and justice sensitivity could work really nicely together. Um, for example, I mean, I think that, you know, when we're not attuned to what matters to the other from their own perspective or by their own lights, um, we're not going to be able, and that's something that I think empathy can help us get at, and justice concerns may or may not probably don't because they're usually um, at, a, at a level of more impartiality, 
then I think that we have some, when we are able to find out um, what concerns um, are there, we could avoid some of the problems that have been raised about simply thinking about justice. Yeah, good. I mean, I just, well, I'll try to briefly summarize, but that, that what I really like is there has been a, a dichotomization of empathy and justice thinking, and I know, I mean, both of us in some way indulge in that dichotomy in, in our work, but this the idea that there might be a, a, an interface, a place where the two can work together. So I think thinking very concretely about how they might come, come together um, is useful. And one, one example, um, uh, you know, if you think, for example, about we're all white folks, the three of us in this conversation, but um, one, one thing you can learn in trying to educate yourself about racial injustice in America is that if you're a person of color, you can't walk into a store without being looked at like you're a potential thief. Or I, w I was speaking to a very um, wonderful professor at the University in Virginia who says when he sees the police you know, on the street, he turns around and takes a different route. And this is like the sweetest and most, also just in terms of appearance, very benign looking, lovely human being. But this idea that an encounter with law enforcement officials could work out badly for you even though you're innocent. An idea that when you walk into a store as an innocent person, you might be falsely accused of something or not given adequate service because you're, you're in uh, an adversarial relationship brought on by structural racism in America. Thinking through what those experiences are like might be an opportunity to let our very numerical notions of justice, it's bad if not everyone is equal, get enriched by some further bit of knowledge, which is that experientially being a victim of injustice has this further, further cost. So epistemically, empathy might serve as a window into the phenomenology of injustice, mm -hmm. which is lost if we just do it by the numbers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that the, that's a really important idea that um, sort of what it, what it means to experience injustice, and maybe not even in that one single encounter in the store or on the street, but to recognize sort of the ways in which um, that repeated um, injustice experience, that repeated experience of injustice can maybe distort perceptions um, in, a, in a bigger way than just in the immediate sense. Um, I think we're seeing a lot of that actually now. And one of the things too that can happen as a result of that practicing, that empathetic putting your position, sitting, putting yourself in that position of um, that individual and understanding how it might be to always have to be mindful of certain kinds of things that those who aren't in, at center of power and privilege have to be mindful of on a regular basis. That also, I think, empathetically can help us sort of expand our sort of ethical sensitivities and sensibilities beyond those immediate situations. So I think there's this, as, a, as you pointed out, I think that if we think about empathy as a skill, then these ways of sort of engaging empathy, honing that skill will then be transferable to other conditions and other situations that aren't um, quite uh, as usual or typical where, I mean, I think, you know, we're always going to be encountering different ways in which injustice um, presents itself. And so um, having empathetic experiences of this sort will be helpful and maybe, maybe more um, robustly, maybe more quickly, understanding how other forms of injustice might be operating. So that seems like a very good thing for empathy to help us with. Good. So let maybe maybe just because I, I have to fulfill my contractual obligation to play skeptical, <laughs> let, let, so let's, I, and that for me has been illuminating because I think uh, in a way what we're seeing is, is a place where empathy could be doing some very meaningful work. So let's maybe talk about limits, potential limits, and it's one place where I think um, there's a potential limit has to do with, with the issue of animal rights, because I think there we're not just dealing with people whose cultural experience may be different from ours, where there's some hope of a partial or movement towards greater understanding. If you think, for example, I didn't I didn't know what your you know your ethics are of the 
the um, moral considerability of of uh, non-cetacean aquatic species. But if you have the view, for example, that it's it's immoral to farm salmon, and not just because of environmental implications, but because of the the well-being of the uh, of the fish involved. You might say, can I come to that view through a kind of process of arriving at full empathy, stepping in the shoes of the salmon who are being farmed? And there, I think we might just hit against it. Will hit against a wall. It might be too strong, but we might get to a point where it's clear that our capacity to engage in that imaginative exercise is so limited, and the knowledge we'd need to acquire to do it is so great that it's kind of it's diminishing returns once we've come to the view that this practice is is harmful or, or cruel to living beings that have feelings and you know sentience and sapience then there's there's no need to engage in that perhaps impossible exercise right okay so um, just go back to our practice so you're you're now wanting to look at the limits of empathetic um, engagement and where it hits it at perhaps um, salmon or I mean I think sort of another if so that's pretty I think that's a really important question about whether it's almost more costly as it were to spend time trying to figure out you know sort of what the umwelt of this very different other might be and you know meanwhile there's all sorts of other reasons for thinking that you know rule-based reasons perhaps that well let's just not do this this is you know um, this is harmful. It's not a. It's an instrumentalizing relationship. It has environmental problems. All this, so we might just say, why do we need empathy in that case? Um, and I guess I want to say two things um, about that. One, because I'm going to try to also stay on the ex more extreme side too. Then I mean, I think that there. Are, well, let me not stay on the extreme side first. So I do think there's a very serious concern that I have, for example, in thinking about sort of mass horrors or, or even just natural tragedies like the earthquake in Nepal. If, if, if we're going to empathize with every individual person who's been harmed or lost their lives or family member who's alive who's lost their loved one, I mean, that just seems too much to have to do, right? And I don't I don't think I've provided an account, and I don't think I've seen an account yet of what does empathy tell us about in these massive, with these massive problems. I mean, I do talk a little bit about overload, and I think that that's 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 a particular problem that could be overcome. But when we're t just thinking about you know factory farming, where there's billions of chickens, I'm not going to try to figure out each and every chicken's perspective or experience, or I'll just be I will be you know, in a state, A, of you know, pain, and also um, it won't be useful. It won't be effective. It's what you're suggesting. Um, and so I think that is a limit, and I, I think that's one to talk about. But I don't want to go to the limit in the case of salmon necessarily just because they're so different. So my first thing, sort of, I understand the, the limit in terms of number. Do I need to empathize with every single salmon that's being farmed. That's that's one of the questions I have about um, the view. But on the other hand, I don't want to say that because the salmon is so different from us, that there's no, it's not useful to empathize. And I think if you think about octopuses and other cephalopods, we have a really great example of why it's so cool and both epistemically, um, but also ethically to be thinking about sort of what it's like to be a very, very different other and what those experiences are. Um, and how our relationships with those others might really change. So I don't want to think of difference as a limit case, but I do think the question about number is is a really important limit case. I wonder if you have thoughts about that, Jesse. Yeah, great. So just to, to uh, briefly summarize, so um, you began, Larry, Lori, by saying that there's this issue of overload, which you, which you write about in your book, that sometimes when we're dealing with tragedy at a very large scale, the cost of trying to empathize with many people is just that you, you shut down. And you've written some very interesting things about that. Um, but on the, on the salmon case, you raise uh, two issues. One is, first of all, challenging the claim that, 
that we can't empathize with, with creatures that are very different from us and that maybe maybe we can go further towards that end than, than I suggested. Uh, but the other, which is which is in the you know, corner of empathy skepticism that I, I have um, occupied, you raised the question of large numbers, that when we get into situations where the, the victims of an injustice are so numerous that the exercise of going through each one would be in, in, in fundamentally in, impossible. Um, so overload is one cost, but then just the sheer impossibility of, of going through that. I, I think that's exactly right. I mean, I think my my own um, skepticism of empathy, I began with this one point about really having, having um, uh, a bias for the in-group, but in a way that's one bullet point among several. So the, the pitfalls of empathy also include a tendency um, to get overloaded. There's a lot of empirical work suggesting that when confronted with distress, people very often experience vicarious distress and it's hard to get out of that and that tends to reduce pro-social motivation rather than increase it. Feeling someone else's pain makes you pain and when you're in pain you feel inactive so you don't you don't want to do anything. You want to you cower and, and nurse your own wounds rather than having the positivity required to come to the service of people in need. But, but a third bullet point, the one that you just mentioned is um, the law of large numbers and there's this there's this um, quote that's uh, you know attributed to to Stalin that paraphrased as you know one person is a is a, or two people dying is a tragedy but a thousand is a statistic and uh, are, we're so challenged when it comes to empathizing with large groups that large, when we confront large numbers we we tend to write it off we, and that's a problem not just for empathy theories it's a problem for justice as well. So the question is how to re-engage um, moral motivation and moral imagination in cases of, of overwhelming tragedy. Um, and some of the most urgent moral matters are of just that kind. You mentioned natural catastrophe, of course, global disease and starvation, um, and system, you know, systematic injustice of the kind we mentioned before. So you could give people a statistic like one in a hundred Americans is in prison, and they're disproportionately uh, poor and the disproportionately black, and that's a chilling. When you hear that, it's very overwhelming. But then you feel like, what you know? What can I do with such something at, of that scale? Um, for our topic, I think the question then becomes: What role does empathy have in these cases of large numbers? There's some empirical work that suggests when you give someone a window on to say poverty, global poverty, by personalizing it, by giving a case study that shows here's a family that's directly affected by this. It's a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it gets them much more motivated to give than if you just present it as a, as a statistic. But on the other hand, they're motivated to give to that family and not deal with the many, many others who are affected by this problem or to the root causes. So I, I, I'm, I'm not, this is a, asking for an answer to these questions is you know the hardest problem in, in applied moral theory, um, but sort of joining you and thinking collectively about them, um, you know I just want to, to agree with you that there is a, is a problem here and to sharpen our our discussion of empathy, one thing we can think through together is does empathy have a have a role to play? Maybe not the sole role, but a role to play in dealing with the problem of, of large scale. Devastation. I wonder if I could uh, jump in on this one too. Um, so yeah. just I was uh, hearing. So you're seeing like three problems uh, with empathy. One is kind of the in-group bias. The other one is that you can get overloaded, kind of emotionally overloaded. And the other is uh, how do you empathize with large numbers? And you're giving uh, <clears throat> uh, kind of examples of that, like with uh, starvation, large numbers in starvation large numbers of African Americans in the prisons or large number of uh, systematic injustice and uh, so you're really looking at how to address uh, this problem of, of large numbers uh, with empathy is that absolutely yes yes and so <clears throat> I just want to throw in a couple um, parts with that is with the uh, with the large numbers <clears throat> it seems that uh, that we can 
that there's this notion of how do, it's kind of like how do we em empathize with large numbers and I'm looking at how do we create a culture of empathy so that the large numbers all empathize with each other so there's like a cultural uh, shift to valuing empathy it's just not us somehow looking down at the third world or someone or developing world that has maybe problems of hunger but how to create like an empathic culture within those uh, communities themselves so you're kind of like maximizing empathy by everybody uh, empathizing with each other um, so that was uh, just one point I want to throw out sure, yeah I so just just to summarize that I mean I do so uh, uh, one thought or a strategy for dealing with these problems of large numbers is to treat empathy systematically to make a culture of empathy where everyone engages in a regular practice of empathizing with, with each other, that some of these big problems of, of systematic injustice might be remedied to some extent if we have capacity to instill uh, empathy as a, as a general part of the, the mindset. Yeah, exactly. Um, I don't know, if, Lori, if you want to come in on that. I mean, no, you go ahead. Go ahead for now, because I have... Um, well, I would just, I mean, there's a lot to say there. I would say it's a, there are geopolitical contexts where one can imagine that a spreading of empathy might be of enormous value and also to a certain degree might be feasible. At least we could mo make movements in that direction. So yesterday was Jerusalem Day and in Israel, um, Israelis were celebrating this as an anniversary of, uh, of the uh, Jewish state and uh, Palestinians who have been frustrated with recent government inaction on a two-state solution were protesting, counter, counter uh, demonstrating in, in uh, Israel and you know this is a case of an enduring political conflict where both sides see the other as an other, see the other as wrong, have a very hard time getting into the perspective um, of the other, and uh, that's that's been a serious hurdle in making progress. And if, if there were a way to cultivate uh, deeper understanding in those places of conflict, then I think we would we would make some progress. So at a at a kind of local level, I can imagine an MPP intervention of being of some of some value. I think the problem with these these cases uh, where it isn't in your personal space, where it isn't at your border, where it isn't in your community, uh, go, and this goes back to the distance point, um, is that if everybody here is empathetic and everyone there is empathetic, we're just not in enough regular contact for those bridges of empathy to matter. And one of the problems with ghettoization is you get people whose communities are cut off in ways that that preclude easy, easy avenues to, to empathy. So I think you could have people of all the right mindset, dispositions to empathy, but they're simply not in regular enough discourse with folks who are in a, in, in a bad way, folks who are worse off, to exercise that capacity. So uh, I would come back to this point about distance being a hurdle for anyone who hopes empathy, uh, hopes for empathy uh, to serve as a kind of panacea. Um, okay, so I think what I heard, so the idea that um, Edwin was raising about um, creating more of an, a space um, and developing skills and encouraging the development of skills for empathy can be very helpful given a variety of political conflicts and sort of just ethical problems that we face, but there's going to be problems of uh, regular practice over distance. Um, we might be able to so the empathetic concern might actually, um, if, we, if we develop these, quote, cultures of empathy, we might reinforce this or this in-group bias <laughs> so that um, we're going to have distant, we're going to have a problem of, of um, getting over um, and crossing those distances and creating certain kinds of ghettos. And um, I think... I, I, I think that that's a worry, again, I think it's a, a worry that can be addressed um, my worry about sort of, um, I mean, I obviously think we should have more, we should practice empathy more and we should 
sort of generate opportunities to become more empathetic. Um, I think that I wanted to go back to this idea of case studies um, suggesting that people are more willing to give to the individual family that was in the case as opposed to more broadly. And what I wanted to think about in developing a culture of empathy, if this is the way to go, is how and when do we go from certain kinds of specific others and, and attention to and uh, relationships with those specific others to when, does it, when is it possible to generalize from that um, at least enough to um, at least avoid some of these problems of big numbers or large numbers. Um, and I know there's these uh, computer simulations I've recently just heard of that where that you could actually do empathy development in the context of sort of you push the button a certain way when you're trying to keep the baby quiet when the guards are outside or whatever. And this allows people help. It's like a tool to help people um, through a computer game understand how to become more empathetic. Um, and that's fairly abstract, right? That's, there's no actual person in the computer <laughs> that you're empathizing with. You're not actually. So it's, it's an imaginative exercise. And then that gets me to thinking something that I know that you're interested in to Jesse is sort of something that Du Bois said about aesthetics and the role that art might play in developing a ability to cross those bridges or cross those expanses. Um, and I think that um, trying to understand, I mean maybe there's ways of, this is just thinking about how we might be able to deal with this problem of, you know, mass despair, mass injustice, without having to specifically look at each individual situation. Um, I wonder if there's a way in which um, our moral imaginations and maybe our aesthetic sensibilities can be um, marshaled to try to help us to become um, better able to address those kinds of empathetic um, pitfalls or limits as you put it, while not completely giving up the idea that being in, able to engage with particular others when the need arises um, is also an important part. And then there would need to be some principle, I guess, that would help us go from you know, the particular to the general and back. And I, I, I'd love this, to think about this with you all because I think these are really important sort of next places. Great. So, Laura, you were helping us by getting pretty uh, concrete and starting to really think about strategies that could be used to, to improve empathy, including various you know, computer uh, software that might help or using art. And I think those are all very, very powerful tools. I was just um, at a dissertation defense, and the student told me he's living in Astoria, Queens, a neighborhood in New York. And he said when he first moved there quite recently, he was just overwhelmed and delighted at how diverse the neighborhood was. So he gets off the train and he sees people of every kind living in the same neighborhood. But when he started to go to the local bars and restaurants, he realized there's just total segregation. So people find their own group and they just frequent the, the spaces where they can be with, with the in-group. So one can imagine an Astoria intervention. So it might be a street fair where you have the cuisine of different groups or you know, it might be a bar that, that really reaches out within local communities and creates, you know, programming or menu or, or community events that are attractive to different groups, different ways of doing that. There might be an information sharing uh, night where community pride, where people get up on a stage and talk about their own cultural groups. So I, I think it's extremely um, important and rewarding to to go beyond sort of abstract theory and start to think concretely about, about these interventions. And, but I think, and, and Laura, you ended on this note of sort of negotiating the local and the, and the global. And I guess, you know, what, what the conversation uh, really brings to mind for me is that there, if we're trying to find a job description for empathy, um, it, it seems like it's going to be especially valuable in those cases where you can come into contact where you're dealing with a neighbor, where you're dealing with members of your community in some geographical, some spatially defined sense with whom there's been a, an obstacle, a barrier of understanding. 
But you know, suppose suppose we sort of shift the conversation and say, well, suppose we wanted to, to create some sort of mechanism for distributive justice in the world. So America is a rich country, and we have a certain amount of wealth that we have chosen to dedicate to, to, to various causes. How should we do this delegation? So one way to do it, option A, is to get a group of very empathetic Congress people who have thought in detailed ways, maybe they've lived in certain other communities, and can really put themselves concretely in the shoes of individuals whose lives go worse on average than, than lives do here. Another way to do it, and this is, sounds like the most cold, horrific Big Brother scenario, give it to a machine. And what the machine does is it tabulates statistics on where the greatest disparities of economic opportunity exist, where, uh, where m the dollar donation uh, money can go farthest. So it does these elaborate calculations at a kind of cost-benefit analysis, and it comes to the conclusion based purely on the numbers, let's allocate here. And now this is a very stark choice. And I guess what I want to suggest, maybe, maybe just by way of provocation, is I'd rather have the computer do it than the group of Congress people. Because I'd worry that their empathetic ties to particular communities and their knowledge of, of very specific information might blind them to the overall best allocation of these resources. So, OK, so the idea here is a so um, again, I think it goes back you're, where you're going back to your original skepticism uh, and your against empathy idea. Well, but I want I sorry to interrupt you, <laughs> but I want to also really really flag that the first part of that was all about yes, here are the, the interventions are describing great. Those are really exciting avenues for a very worthwhile pursuit, and the application of empathy there is a positive thing with great moral value, but but more locally so. Right, so that, it, but so that again, that we, we can only empathize, I mean, so it's again just sort of really limp, your, your idea is that um, within our own communities and within our own local groups, we're able to empathize and that's good and that really just goes back to that initial work, um, thought you had, which is the real value of empathy is in our personal closer relations, our family relations, our professional relations, maybe our neighborhood relations, maybe even our whole sort of societal relations if we could understand the society in some meaningful way. Um, but ultimately that that's really where empathy has its value. This is something that you've agreed to, but that when we get to these larger problems, um, problems of in inequality and problems of global poverty and injustice um, and mass suffering, we're not really, empathy doesn't really help and that's why you would prefer to go with a machine to distribute some needed resources that can somehow capture everything. And I guess at this point it, it's important for me to suggest um, one of the aspects of my thinking about empathy um, that is pretty much at the core of why I think it's an alternative ethic to the kind of um, you know more utilitarian view that the computer might be able to solve, um, and that is that we're in these very complicated relationships, and I, I actually think of these relationships as being some somewhat of a, a network that goes out. So it's not just my relationship to you as a fellow philosopher, um, or you know, to all of us as people who are interested in for and against empathy, or to you know, say whatever. But that my relationships are sort of really, really um, attenuated. They're, they go in all different directions and so part of what I think is really important in ethics and that's missing from our standard accounts is that we don't sort of focus on the ways in which our choices and actions reflect um, our, uh, our agency and, and, and I think that if we go to the, com the computer route um, you know, I'm just reminded. So, confession, small autobiographical <laughs> confession. I used to be really the hardcore computer root person, I thought. Mm -hmm. There's this mass amount of suffering. There's an answer to figuring out how to end the suffering. We just need a computer or a dictator or something that will help us end this, this suffering. Um, and I think that what's missing from that picture is that um, 
that we all, and maybe this gets back to Edwin's point too, that we're all in these relationships um, and that when we sort of allow for the situation we're in of injustice to be reduced to some abstract calculation um, that we miss too much of the sort of, if you will, the, the moral nitty gritty um, that's going to help us ultimately become better as a ethical you know, actors and agents. And so um, part of what I think is really useful about empathy is it it is other directed but it's also self-directed. It's a dialogical kind of process where we're going from the first person to the third person and we're not forgetting the first person in that picture. Um, and so what we want to try to do, I think it's really important, um, is to see empathy as as not just a way of improving the world but also to sort of if you will improving our own moral agency and giving having computers do that is kind of my feeling is it's a way it, it's a way of uh, eschewing our responsibilities and so let some computer take care of it and also missing a lot of the good stuff but yeah great so a lot in there I mean I think this point about being interconnected and having interconnections that extend far broader than we thought is one of the lessons I got from your book, the concept of entanglement and the extent of those entanglements. And of course, in, in other work, in your work on ecofeminism, the whole notion of an ecosystem brings to mind the ways in which we are, our symbioses may be far greater than we, we appreciate. So I think um, those are important points to take home. To this, this idea that empathetic training, empathetic practice, it's partially a matter of improving our own moral agency. And in the book, you too talk about the importance of preserving the self-other distinction in ways that I think uh, should be should be kept on the table. Um, so I I appreciate both those points. Um, you know, on the there, on the on the con specific concern that if we offload moral responsibility to machines, we we miss out on that opportunity to improve ourselves ethically. Uh, I I. I take that. I mean, I think that's a good a good point. We certainly we certainly wouldn't want to take the the road of letting all moral decision making be done by machines, and then we could we are amoral or even immoral lives, and let it all work out that way. We we ultimately want to operate as moral agents um, within our own lives. Um, I I think by raising points about long distance entanglements, you can get people to recognize that they have um, a responsibility to people elsewhere in the world. Um, but here I really think that this sort of speaking as a moral psychologist, the mechanism there is not one of empathy, it's of a different kind. And an, an example that, that comes to mind is when you remind yourself that the clothing you wear and the furniture that surrounds you, all of the trappings of a life in the in the first world, depend on the labors of people who are less well off, often very distant people who are living in conditions we, we can't imagine. That the the privileges we enjoy are built on suffering. That kind of realization is a kind of uh, ecological realization. It's a it's an entanglement realization. It's one that says I'm not innocent. I'm not, my life is implicated in injustice. It's not just that I have this kind of third-person concern as a kind of moral superhero for a third-party situation with which I have no uh, connection. Um, hugely moral motivating in the sense that when you make people see this, they feel guilt, they feel responsible, um, they, uh, they realize that inaction is not an option because inaction means continuous uh, perpetration. So I think those are great moments of insight in moral, uh, moral development. Um, it's, it's true we might you know, go further and get to a level of nuance by now trying to get our heads uh, into the space of somebody whose labors we're exploiting. Um, but I want to suggest once you've gotten to this particular juncture of moral insight, it's it's not clear a that 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 further step is necessary, nor two that it's really helpful. It might actually be destructive, because 
when we go that local, after we've seen this kind of systematic problem to return to that idea, it, it I think, misallocates where our moral energy should be. Our moral energy should be trying to deal with, uh, you know, with international labor issues, uh, not try to approve the, the lives of, of a few individuals who we happen to have imagined. Yeah, um, this idea of um, the what that you raised of sort of the way in which um, the moral psychology and the motivational sort of scaffolding, if you will, um, is sort of going to sort of help us gain insight. I love this. Well, I just have to stop because this moral superhero is just such a great concept. <laughs> I just think that's just a, well, everybody stop. Moral superhero. That like avoid being the moral superhero. Of that. But the guilt and responsiveness and, and inaction and recognizing that inaction isn't an option is what happens when you have these entangled recognition. And I think that um, that you do get insights there. You and I think you quite rightly though point out that when we realize that the sort of labor in the, some sweatshop in, in the Philippines or somewhere um, is making our clothes and suffering, that empathy might not be what we need to be engaged in at that moment. Um, and, and, that's, and you mentioned that that was at the individual level and perhaps what we need to be thinking about is something at the structural level. I don't disagree with that at all. I actually quite, I quite agree with that. I thought what you were going to say was that when we, if we were to become empathetic in that moment, we would find that many of those workers have so little options that they actually prefer the life of slave or close to slave labor versus what the alternatives would be. That's a really unfortunate situation to figure out empathetically, if that's what you get. Um, then I think you could make some more corrections there. But I, again, I, I, I think... Um, I don't know that we have to um, really divide things into sort of focusing on the individual um, versus coming up with some sort of structural analysis. And this just gets us back to the ways in which I think empathy and justice can work together. I mean, it does seem like if you have a systematic um, process of exploitation, which we clearly do in global capital, um, then you know, no individual empathetic attention is going to be particularly um, helpful because the system is going to continue. So I think there's a problem. Um, you're quite right to point that out, but I don't know that we can't, I don't see it as incompatible with empathy to recognize that as an empathetic individual what we now, um, what empathy asks us to do is understand and think about and work towards those structures um, that will change this exploitative system for many people, not just the individuals that we might have in our in our sort of immediate vision. But I guess I wanted to ask you a little bit more here about the motivational structure. Um, and so, um, and, and, and I'm, I'm genuinely just asking um, about um, if you might, is guilt the kind of thing that a non-empathetic person experiences? I mean, what I guess, what I would imagine that um, empathy is the kind of thing that might generate a feeling of um, responsibility or guilt. But I, I'm, I'm wondering, are there other, other mechanisms? So I wonder if you might talk about that. Maybe Edwin, you know as well. Do you know about what the sort of moral psychological structure of guilt is? Uh, <clears throat> well, when I think of uh well, what I hear is you're wondering about how, what's the relationship of morality and guilt and how does that fit in with empathy, how the relationship there. Or does and it were, fit in, yeah. Or, and you were talking about the sweatshop, like in a sweatshop, somebody's working in a sweatshop and we're connected with, with uh, the people in the sweatshop because of our clothes. I think that was what uh, Jesse was talking about. Uh, the way I would look at that is uh, it is... For me, it's an empathy issue in terms of the sweatshop owner and the sweatshop worker. Are they in an empathic relationship with each other? Does the, sweat, does the, does the sweatshop owner feel like they're being empathized with by the, the worker? And does the worker feel empathized with uh, by the sweatshop owner? And are they in an empathic relationship? And that's like this ongoing dialogue. So for me here, I'm trying to create a 
a rela an empathic relationship between the two of those as well as for myself. I want to empathize with the sweatshop owner for all the stresses and strains they may be going through as well as the uh, stresses and strains that the worker might be going in and then foster an empathic dialogue between them and, and their community. Uh, so anyway, that's kind of what one aspect uh, that comes up. Um, so I kind of frame everything kind of around empathy and how we can create more empathic relationship between others. And uh, I do feel a little stressed for time here. I heard your dinger go off. We have five minutes. Uh, I, mean, I can talk for ages, but I know we had set the hour uh, limit. So I don't know if we should like close or come to some closing comments or. Can I? Um, so, so what? It's really interesting to hear what you had to say when about this. So, for you, the 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 task is um, the empathetic task is in part to build and encourage empathy amongst others, which is kind of a meta empathetic sort of engagement in a way. Um, and so, I think I'm still I sort of wonder then. Um, if guilt does play a role, because one of the one of the things that Jesse talks about um, is that sort of we we don't we don't need empathy so much. We need things like guilt and anger and outrage oh. and indignation. Um, and so that's sort of where I was trying to go. Is is um, it? I mean, tip for me. I think if you're being empathetic in some circumstances, the re the empathetic reaction, the empathetic response, not reaction, but response, is anger or indignation. Um, so I, I can see how anger and indignation and empathy are, are compatible in my understanding. But guilt is another thing, so that's mm -hmm. sort of where... Oh, so you're really looking at what's the relationship with guilt and empathy, like do I feel guilty that someone is maybe being abused, there's a sense of abuse for someone, and I have a role in that. And so right. how and is that going to motivate you to act differently vis-a-vis -vis yeah. that situation? There is. I mean, just well, just to maybe recap a little bit. Um, so you raised questions about the role of, of guilt and empathy. Uh, Edwin uh, came in with a nice suggestion that it's not just a matter of cultivating empathy in yourself, but trying to promote it in others. So some remote cases of exploitation might be remedied not by anything we do directly, but through meta-empathy, as, as Lori described it, um, I think, aptly. Um, on this issue of it, uh, guilt, I mean, empirically, there is a lot of evidence that guilt leads to pro-social motivation. Uh, so I'm thinking of things like there's a, uh, a lot of work by, by Jun Peng Ni looking at uh, how guilt leads to reparative behaviors, and also there are studies showing that guilt leads to, to, to uh, pro-social giving, just to so after administering electrical shocks to others, uh, unrelated others, people are more likely to give to a charity. Um, there's a lovely old study by Paul Smith showing that people donate more uh, before entering a confession booth at a Catholic church than afterwards. Uh, so once they've gotten rid of their, their guilt feelings, they're, they're, they're more stingy. Uh, when they're carrying these, they want to improve the world in various ways. So there is an empirical literature. I would say, just um, for the record, the literature on the, the impact of empathy is, um, is more disappointing. So there are people who have argued, there's a, a meta-analysis by, by Neuberg and, and uh, Cialdini arguing that when there's any cost, people don't really act pro-socially when they empathize. So you can get them to empathize, but they don't tend to do much for others when they feel empathy. They can express the empathy and give voice to it, but it doesn't lead to pro-sociality. The one researcher who systematically find, finds a link between costly interventions and empathy um, is, um, is Dan Batson, who's done some of the most important work on empathy in, in all of psychology. But his empathy manipulations, uh, it's been argued by Chialdini, also introduced this in-group effect. They, they really emphasize the sense of, of oneness or connectedness to the person who is poised to, to suffer. So um, there is a question whether we can really get strong behavioral impacts through interventions that encourage empathy when the person with which we empathize is, is very unlike us. Um, 
So I would I would submit that my current read of the empirical literature, and you also mentioned anger, which you discuss I think positively in your book. There there are good reasons to think that anger, which is connected behaviorally to punishment, and guilt, which is connected behaviorally to prosociality, are by and large stronger motivators than empathy. Mm -hmm. I think you raised a pointed question is could you even get these things off the ground without empathy? Um, and there are people like Martin Hoffman who have argued, in fact, that you can't. So I think asking about the relationship between these different emotions, and especially not being you know, too doctrinaire about it, it's got to be empathy. And as you say in the book, thinking about these, how these emotions work together is, is a very uh, productive direction. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I had so much I could say about that, about the rule, but uh, I want to uh, bring it to a close. Um, perhaps we can have another dialogue specifically on guilt or empathy or anger and empathy. Maybe that would be productive mm -hmm. to really get, because I really feel kind of an energy around kind of the relationship of these deeper uh, emotions or feelings and and uh, kind of the, how they relate to each other. There, there, um, think, I just want, Jesse's, Jesse's sort of uh, the master of the um, moral psychological literature, so that was really, really helpful to think through it. And I think it's really important, just in summarizing a little bit here, too, that um, empathy, oftentimes we think of sort of, the, uh, just as we talked about initially, is sort of empathy versus justice, or also there's a, a way in which we often think of love versus anger. Or these things aren't, I think, are are much close, more closely connected. And even if they're not connected, it seems to me that at least at some level, we really do want to try to see the ways in which they're compatible. Um, and yeah, and so I think there's more to be said too on this sort of pro-sociality undercurrents and what those various emotions um, might be because if they if they if they could become part of a package, um, mm -hmm. it seems that some of the difficulties for and against empathy would uh, be eliminated. Yeah, because of the the guilt is I feel guilty because I'm not empathizing with you because I didn't empathize with you. Actually, that's happened to me several times. Like people. You know, basically, you said, I didn't feel hurt, I didn't feel seen, and I feel, oh my goodness, I didn't, you know, I'm in tears for having not really heard the person and seen the person if empathy is like this core value. So it's really, you know, that's what the guilt is, is a feeling of uh, not having empathized uh, with the other person. So anyway, I, I'm starting up another conversation. Yeah, it looks uh, like you're <laughs> I, did, I would want to add just in, in summary that I, I thank anyone who's who's uh, listened to us and, and I really thank the people who have made it this far. You'll have discovered that, that there's much more common ground here than the debate format might have um, indicated. And Lori even said to me before we sat down today, I you know, I think we agree about about um, much more than we disagree about. And I think that's absolutely true. And and part of that is that I have, have uh, learned a lot and been influenced by, by Lori's work. We have other loci of common ground. We're both skeptical of the focus on rights, for example, in moral theory, the topic we didn't touch on today. But I think even in thinking through empathy, one of the things that I really value in Lori's work is it is it is a nuanced view that gives gives empathy an important role, but sees it as connected to these other things like like justice and, and maybe to like guilt and anger that have sometimes been seen as competitors for an empathy theoretic approach. Well, thank you both thank you, for uh, taking part in this and also for trying the empathic listening. So just quickly, I, I enjoyed that part. Uh, how was it for you? That's great. <laughs> it was good. It was, it, was, um, it, it, um, it allowed, I think, um, sort of a, a, a more, um, Sort of constructive uh, conversation. I think. I think it was great. Thanks so much, Jesse. Thanks for. Um, thanks for. Um, both actually. You I know, mean, one of the things that I think is important um, to highlight here too. Before we get into too many um, sort of niceties about each other, I really appreciate your positive comments. But I also think that you know it. Jesse's been really an important figure in allowing us to think hard and carefully about 
the role of, of emotions and sentiments again in ethics. So thanks to Jesse for that. Even if we might disagree at the margins, um, they owe Jesse a great deal. Thanks, Lori. And Edwin, um, so great to sit down with you again. And this was much better than I love talking to you alone, <laughs> having the two of you together. That's really wonderful. So I appreciate the opportunity to, to, to have this conversation as well. Yeah. Thanks, Edwin.